Thank you. Hi, ladies. How are you? Thank you so much for coming. Nice to see you. God bless you. We are talking about Parshat Yitro, Kabbalat Torah. Okay, so uh, let's uh, try to explore this Parsha. Once there was uh, a hunter, okay, and this hunter was blind from birth, couldn't see. How could he be a hunter? He heard very well, you know, because he couldn't really see. He really sharpened his hearing. So he was uh, stay still, wait, and know exactly where to throw his arrow. And he always, always uh, hit the target, always. He became so professional that the king of Spain asked him to be his main chief hunter. Arturo was the name of this uh, hunter, right? He, uh, every time the king wanted to, I don't know, glorify his, uh, his palace with a new head of a, of a deer or something, years ago it was allowed, you know, hunting was uh, not only allowed, it was recommended, it was one of the hobbies of the kings, uh, you know, back in time. And um, they really, really liked it. It was legal, it was fine. So the king heard that there's a special, rare kind of uh, a lion that is roaming around in, in the forest. And he called Arturo and he asked him to catch uh, to the, this lion for him. Of course, why not? He took his tools, his bow, his arrow, his uh, uh, whatever he needs, and he went to the forest. And in the forest, he found a hiding place where he could really, you know, hide himself. And the whole secret of good hunting is waiting, waiting for the prey. So he was waiting silently, was now moving, you know, all those excellent movements. Waiting, waiting, patiently, patiently, until he heard the roar. He heard the roar and then he sharpened his ears, prepared his bow, his arrow, whatever. And once he felt that he got, you know, he knows exactly where the line, he took out uh, this uh, bow and he, you know, threw it uh, to, to, the, to the target. He was sure that he hit it. But then he hears a roar. He didn't understand what happened. He was sure that he he found he found that he was able to to hit the target. So he tried one more time. Another time he waits and waits until he feels that he he knows where exactly to send this arrow. He sent back another arrow, and and then. He, he missed again, and he couldn't understand what happened, and he felt so bad about himself. He heard from a distance uh, a weak roar, not, not uh, the one. So he, he understood that maybe he injured this, uh, this uh, lion, he harmed him somehow or something, but he was very devastated. He was scared that he lost his position, he lost his job by the, by the king. The king won't call him anymore, he's a failure, he lost his talents, he doesn't know what to do with himself, twice he missed. And he felt that um, he was so disappointed and devastated, he left the, the, the forest towards the king's palace to inform him that he wasn't able to, to, to do this task this time. The king said, impossible, I don't believe you. I know that you are the best, cannot be. So the t king takes him, you know, with his uh, carriage or whatever, they go to the forest to check what exactly happened there. They come to the forest and the hunter pointed to the king, where is supposed to be this line? The king says, unbelievable what I see. 
He says, no, tell me, I don't see. What do you see? He says, you hit two arrows, he said, right? There are two lions uh, dead here. Each and one of them had a, uh, had a, a, a bow, um, you know, yeah, arrow. the arrow inside. One lion, one lioness. Oh. Yeah, it's, you know, the, the female. Oh, wow. And in between them goes a wondrous, a little cub, a little oh. lion that is looking for his parents, and this is the roar, the faint roar that, that you heard. It's, it's not that you harm him, that you hurt him or anything, it's the baby. So look at you, you were able to eat both, you know, father and mother, whatever, whatever I asked you to do, you are the greatest. Don't think that you are a failure. You know your job, you know what you're doing, you know you're, 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 you still have your talents and you're great, right? So sometimes we're scared, we're afraid that uh, our progress is for vain and you don't see anything coming out of it. You see that, uh, you don't see the results sometimes right away and it bothers you and, and you know, you may give up or you may, you say to yourself, it's not for me or something. No, every progress makes a difference and, 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 and you do so much, you're able, you're capable, you, 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 you can do it, don't be afraid, you could do it. And uh, this is just an introduction to uh, the shiur that we'll learn about uh, Yitro. In Yitro, Yitro was this uh, man, he was uh, Moshe Rabbeinu's father-in-law. And he came to Israel, to the camp of Israel, after all the miracles that he heard about, okay, that happened to Am Yisrael. What are the miracles, says Rashi? The splitting of Yamsuf and the fight against Amalek. Okay. What did he see? Why did he come? Why did he want to join the Jewish nation after he uh, heard uh, about these miracles? So, um, Bnei Israel, pay attention. So many people heard about what happened to Israel. It says, "As nevalu al feidu, elav moav yuchazem orad, namogu kol shvei knan, tipol alei mematav afachad." You know, all the nations got scared, were in shock, got frightened, were trembling from fear, were shaking, were afraid. There is a description, if you remember, in Sefer Yehoshua, when Yehoshua sent um, two spies to check on Israel, just before entering Israel, so Rahab, well, that became later on Yehoshua's wife, mm -hmm. she told him 40 years after the fight against Amalek and, and the splitting of Yamsu. Four years later, she told him, we are still trembling, we are still scared because you're going to come and conquer us. We're so afraid. So it was real truth, the fact that they were all scared. So now see how the other nations, how did they respond to this? Some were trembling, some were afraid, some were this, some were that. Amalek, that didn't have anything to do with Am Yisrael, we didn't threaten him. <laughs> we didn't even come close to him. He just sits all over. He doesn't have a place or something. But he felt that he must fight against Israel. So he came to fight against Israel. And what did Yitro do? Yitro did the most fascinating thing out of all of these responses that I just mentioned. He decided that he wants to convert and to join Amisai. And this no one did till now. Yitro, Katush, Raya, Kohen, Midian. He was a very, very important figure. Uh, our commentaries say that Yitro was uh, worshipping any idol that possible. He was trying to, he was checking this one, he was checking that one, he was trying to know, he was searching. He was a, a guy that is looking for the truth. Once he found the truth, what did he see? He saw how Hashem created the miracles. Okay, till then, you have to understand, people believed in uh, idols. Idols, the basis of the perception of idols means that uh, there's all type of forces in the world, evil forces and good forces. 
Sometimes evil forces are winning, sometimes good forces are winning, and everyone tries to destroy the other one. Here comes he, what Yitro understood is that the same power, which is Hashem, were able to, to use the same tool, for example, the water. He took the water, okay, and for the Egyptians it became blood, and they drowned in, in there eventually also in, in the water. But to the Jews, he made so much good. You know, split the sea. He saw how Hashem controls the world. It's not only that Hashem created the world. Hashem created the world. Hashem runs the world. Hashem, Hashem protects people who follow him. You know, the Jewish nation, the other people who follow him. Hashem cares. Hashem, Hashem is involved in everything, you know? And it's not that we worship Hashem to benefit something from it. No. <laughs> we worship Hashem because there's, there's a law, there's a Torah. Okay, the Torah balances us. So many philosophers that we know, people in the past, that believed in certain ideology, which was very, very interesting, but they didn't implement it into their own life into their own, uh, the way that they see, they, they were not, they, they, they could have been spiritual, but it didn't, it, 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 they didn't take the commitment, you know, I should really uh, follow this path, go through this way. And in the Torah, the Torah teaches us and guides us how to be human, how to be considerate of other people, how to care, okay, what is faith, what is belief, what is, you know, all this other stuff. So, Yitro, uh, uh, Yitro, some say that also made, circumcised himself, okay, and uh, came to be with the Jewish people. He was the first one, look at this, he was the first one who used this term Baruch Hashem. Oh, oh wow. And we learned it from him. What does he say? He came to Moshe Rabbeinu and all the Jewish nations and said, Baruch Hashem, thank Hashem, that saved you from the Egyptians and from this and from that and whatever, whatever, whatever. Right? He comes as a stranger. Sometimes, you know, we as Jewish people, we saw so much miracles. Mm -hmm. You know, the ten plagues and, and then the splitting of the Yamsu. And then, every day, miracles too. The man is something... Yeah. Wonder, wonderful that, you know, who have thought of such a thing, such a miracle thing, and then the slav that they also got twice, uh, they, twice a day they got food. Once they got the man, once they got the meat, special meat. All of these uh, special uh, uh, birds that came to give them meat, right? So much miracles that they saw, plus all this Ananek Kavod that protected them. They should go smooth in the, in the desert, you know, air-conditioned area, you know, everything is nice and smooth and beautiful. And they, because it became a routine for them, they didn't stop to say thank you to Hashem. And here comes a, a troll, an outsider, that checks him up a little bit and says, hello, say Baruch Hashem, say thank you to Hashem. So many miracles you're going through, it's unbelievable, right? This is the beauty that we see by Yitro. So, um, Yitro was this person that was always full of gratitude. When this Egyptian, Mitzri, that Moshe came and he saved his daughter from the Midianim, so he tells them, why did you leave this person? Why didn't you call him? Why didn't you offer him or, or invite him to a meal? You know, call, go, look for him. He was caring. He was always, you know, uh, full of gratitude, which is very, very important uh, quality trait. And um, and uh, he, uh, from him, the Gemara tells tells us, teaches us that. Whoever sees a miracle that uh, whoever has had a miracle in some place, he should say, Baruch Shasali Nes Makom Azeh. Okay? Blessed Hashem that made me a miracle in this place. We learned it from Yitro. Because thanking Hashem is not only, okay, now something good happened to me, I thank Hashem and I continue on. 
you have to continue thinking Hashem also in the future for the same thing that happened to you in the past. Okay? This is something that He teaches us. You have to keep uh, thanking Hashem for, uh, continue thanking Hashem for things that happened to you in the past. This thinking is eternal, something that we have to do constantly. So, uh, this is something that uh, Yitro teaches us. So, Yitro basically implemented, okay, whatever he saw. He was searching, as I said. You all know the story, so know the story of this um, uh, cab driver in Israel that once a rabbi came into his uh, yeah. car and he says, Rabbi, you see, I'm not religious, but I know that there's God. He says, well, how do you know that there's God? He, he said, whenever we were in the army, okay, so we were not in the, you know, we, we, there was this, uh, one of my friends, a huge snake, okay, came towards him and started to go around him wrapped himself around it, you know, the snakes, they, they have so much power, they have so much strength. And one of his, one of our friends, another soldier told him, Seish my son, Seish my son, it's going to help you. So this soldier didn't even know the words. He had to tell him and he, and he repeated and he said, Shema Israel, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad. Miraculously, this snake started to lose its grip and, and he left him and then he left and he went. No one, and you could never hear such a thing, such a miracle, that once a snake already found its prey, it's going to leave it just as that. He won't leave it. If anything, he will uh, bite him or, or something. But he left him and nothing happened. And he survived. And so this uh, cup driver tells the rabbi, you see, there is Hashem. So the rabbi is asking him, so why aren't you wearing a kippah? Why aren't you religious? He said, it happened to him. It didn't happen to me. What do you want from me? <laughs> it didn't happen to me. What do you want from me? <laughs> so many miracles that we see today, every day we see, you know, whether it's here in Israel, in the war, whatever, whatever. We hear of miracles. We, the same that he told it, he... So many nations heard about them, about this miracle, but none of them did anything about this. Yeah, mm -hmm. he was the only one who decided to do an action. He left his uh, place wherever he lived, even though they were very upset at him, even though you know they were started to make fun of him or whatever. He didn't care. He went with his truth, you know, all the way. So, uh, so now. His, by the way, his reward was that his children, his great-great-grandchildren, were sitting in Lishkata Gazit, in the, where the Sanhedrin are. You know, the, the big rabbis, they sit and, you know, in the court, and uh, they were sitting and teaching Torah. Lishkata Gazit was in the Holy Temple, and so, you know, and he got a nice portion in Israel also, he threw, so... Uh, he got a nice, uh, he got nice thing. So, just to uh, explain you why he got this special um, reward, when Itro came, Itro was not an, an anonymous person. He came as a, a priest, a high priest that everyone knew, and he came after the war against Amalek. Amalek. You know, it wasn't the greatest war <laughs> that uh, that we went through. You know, it was it was very tough on Moshe. He, his hands became weak, and and he, uh, Amalek was able to catch all those people that that the cloud rejected. Okay? He was able to catch them. So uh, Yitro came after this war, and I'll soon explain you more about the Amalek. But basically, the Zohar explains that once people saw the capacity, this, this personality, this big person as a priest, the, the highest priest that come to join the nation, the, Jew, the Jewish nation, name of Hashem was glorified. And this is the Kiddush Hashem that he did. He throw. This is why it was so, so special. When Hashem revealed himself to the Jewish nation, before he gave them the Torah, he really offered the Torah to so many nations. You know this Midrash that says that first he went to uh, Edom. Edom are descendants of Esau. And he offered them the Torah. 
and they asked what's written there, Hashem said, Lo tirzach, do not commit murder. And they said, oh, we're sorry, all our essence is killing. Even Yitzhak Avinu, when he blessed Esa, he said, Al you should live on your sword. <laughs> so this is our essence, what do you want from us? We, we cannot accept the Torah because we, it's in our blood to kill our people. And then he says, he went to Bnei Amun, Moab. He went to them, do you want to accept the Torah? What's written there, they asked. And it says, Lotin Af, do not commit adultery. He said that you, you know that our essence is adultery. How were Ammon and Moab created? Father had relations with his daughters. What is this? Yeah? So we can't. It's, it's in our blood. And then he went to the Ishmaeli, to the Arabs. They asked, What's written? He said, Do not steal. Our essence is stealing. It says about Ishmael, Yado Bakol, Veyat Kol Bov, Uya Pere Adam. He's going to be a wild person. He's, he has to touch everywhere. What do you want from us? This is our essence. We cannot really work against our, our, our nature. So then Hashem went to, to the Jewish people. They said, Nasev and Ishmael, no problem. We don't even ask what's, what's written there. We accept it, no problem. Yeah? So. Uh, there was no nation that Hashem didn't offer this Torah. What did they all say? It's too big for us. We can't. It's too much. It's so limiting, limiting us. We're not allowed to do this. We're not allowed to do this. We're not allowed to do this. It's too much for us. We cannot really accept it. So, tell me if you know a common Gentile that would give up on eating shrimps, or pork, or not doing anything for 24 hours, like a big Shabbat, <laughs> or, you know, uh, unforbidden relationship. Okay, I don't say that all of them, uh, God forbid, uh, do all this uh, crazy stuff, but um, there are a lot of other things that are easier, let's say, taking interest. By us, it's not allowed. By then, it's their job. It, it, this is the way that they work. This is the business, this is how the business runs. And um, and uh, do not uh, do, do not come, do not touch uh, or do uh, touch unforbidden uh, relationship means even before marriage when they when they come close to each other when they do they have no restriction in there right I don't have to tell you we have so many laws and so. Um, one of the rabbis here say that when you're Jewish, it's not only that you're different. Your essence is different. Everything is different. You are recognized by the fact that you're Jewish. The way that you're dressed, we put on tzitzit to remind us there and to have to be afraid of Hashem. And you know, we're wearing kippah and we're wearing this and that and bring me line, all this stuff. All these things for what? Okay? to remind us constantly, <laughs> hello, you have responsibilities as a Jew. It's not so simple. And now my big question is, are these responsibilities are in our favor or, you know, it just limits us and, and you know, we just suffer from this. So, know who you are. See how, if you are capable of doing stuff, and you are. So, once there was this uh, chicken, chicken um, coop. I almost said so chicken soup. <laughs> Once there was this chicken coop, and uh, you know, father uh, rooster, mother chicken, little little chicks, and uh, they were, uh, you know, in they were, you know, there was, was a big, vast plain, and they were. Uh, uh, in that area. <coughs> Above them, uh, however, was a mountain, and on top of the mountain was this huge, big rock, and in there was um, an eagle nest. Mm -hmm. One time there was a big storm, okay, 
and this storm, I don't know, moved everything around and one egg fell from this eagle's nest and slipped into this chicken soup somehow, chicken coop somehow. In the morning, father and mother, you know, the chickens, they get up and they see a weird, huge, bigger uh, egg in there and they don't know what to do with this. Mm -hmm. So they accepted it, they put it inside, the woman starts, to, the, 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 the mother, the chicken starts to hatch on it, to sit on it. After 21 days, new chicks are, are, are uh, hatching from there, but this one not yet. And they keep, she keeps uh, sitting on that and warming it and warming it. And right. Only after a week or two, this uh, weird, big, huge, different uh, chick or bird or something comes out. They didn't know what to do with this, but okay, what can you do? So they uh, give it, it food like, like to all the others and taking care of it and father and mother tells them what's allowed, what's not allowed, you're allowed to eat this, you're not allowed to do this. One thing they warned them, that there's a huge uh, nest on top of that mountain of the eagles, and the eagles like very much to eat little chicks, so they have to be careful, always, always come back uh, towards the evening, be around the chicken coop, not to go so much, not to stray so much far, because they will be, uh, you know, food. <laughs> they will be devoured. This little chick, uh, so it wasn't little, it was a weird one, right? From some reason, had this... Uh, uh, he, 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 huh? Instinct. Instinct. He really wanted to go up. He didn't understand why. He always wanted to fly higher, to be, you know... He was bigger than all of them. He was eagle. He was an eagle, he didn't know. <laughs> He was heard that he's a chicken. He didn't know that he was an eagle, right? Mm -hmm. So one night, he, he leaves the, the, the chicken coop, and he tries to go on top of the mountain, tries to go up. It was so difficult for him. It wasn't easy. He went through some 50 meters or something, and then he was afraid it's going to be dawn soon. He quickly ran towards the, the chicken coop. However, he was able to open his wings and he got to the chicken coop so much quicker than, you know, struggling and going up. The next night, he's trying even to go further and he was able to go so much more further and he was able to also uh, go down so much faster. And each and every day, he feels that he's able to do much more, much more, much more. One night he left and he, he got to the top of the mountain, to the peak, you know, to the summit where the, the, yes. the, the nest is, and he had to decide. Mm -hmm. And the father and the mother, you know, the eagles look at him like, yeah, you're one of us, but we don't recognize you. Where do you come from? And what is this? But they let him in. He stays there, and the father announces that tomorrow morning, early in the morning, they have to migrate, they have to fly, all the way to a different continent because this is what birds do. They fly to far, far destinations for the warmer area. Mm -hmm. And he says to his kids, you're able, you're capable, don't worry, you're going to just spread your wings and you're going to fly, you're going to be okay. And the birds can't wait. And so the little one, you know, this one, the, the weird one, didn't know. What should he do? He, will he be able to do that? So early in the morning, the father spreads his wings and he goes and he waits for, for the mom and for the kids to, to follow him. So this is what all of them did. And the little one still doesn't know, should he join them or not? He's not sure, is it a chicken or is he, or is he a, a, an eagle? So then he decides he's going to open his wings and if he's going to be able to do it, it means that he's an eagle. And yeah, he opened and he saw he has huge, uh, strong uh, wings and he followed them and he says if I'm able to follow you uh, it means that I'm an eagle and he continued okay wasn't scared wasn't afraid because you know in the beginning he wasn't sure was he will he be able to go all this distance it's, it's far away but once he felt that he's able to do it if he has the special strength the special power it means that he's an eagle and he will be able to do it so all of us, we go through this inner 
fight or, or dispute, will I be able to do certain thing or not? You know, mm-hmm. you're right. wondering, you want to take up on yourself mitzvah of uh, Shabbat, let's say, <laughs> Shabbat, so many details, or it's new, also, should I wear this dress or should I wear this? This is more tight, this is more short, this is more flashy, this is more this, this is more that, and, and you keep asking, will I be able to take it upon it? You know, Rosh Hashanah comes, let's say, and you want to take upon yourself certain, certain thing, Kabbalah. And you don't know, will I be able to do, will I be able to go all, all year long with this? You want to take upon yourself another portion in the tefillah, which will take you another 10, 10 minutes or 5 minutes each and every day, I don't know. Will I be able to stand it? Will I be able to do it? You know, there's all types of things. Sometimes you're busy, sometimes you're tight in time, sometimes you're, you're in the train or, or somebody's calling or I don't know exactly. And, and you, you're, you're scared to take upon yourself stuff. Uh, we all go through these um, uh, uh, questions that we're asking ourselves, but hey, you have, to, you have to understand that in our DNA, okay, we got the powers of Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. They went through, how did they become these great people? If not because they had the struggles, they also had struggles. Okay? okay, they also have tests, and, and they were able to withstand all these tests. If they will be able to do it, we can do it too, because we are their, their descendants, okay? Yosef HaTzadik, Achelimenu, Le'ah, this, all of them, they went through a different, different tasks, different uh, tests in life, and they were able to do it. So our job is to get to the peak, to the high, okay? Not to be afraid, and to, we could do it, through our tefillot, we can do it with Kiyu Mitzvot. We can, we, we, when we do mitzvot, with enthusiasm, with, with happiness, okay? And, uh, and we can do it, it's just that we have to believe ourselves that we'll be able to do it. This is the question, do you believe yourself that you will be able to do it? So, uh, but in the beginning, when uh, Moshe Rabbeinu went up to heaven to accept the Torah, Hashem told him, Atem reitem et asher asitil mitzrayim. You saw what I did to, to Egypt. Vayesayat chem al kanfei nesharim. I brought you with the eagle's wing and I brought you to me. I, 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 I elevated you. I brought you higher. Okay? So, from one side, yeah, it's we, it's us. We did this, this first action, but Hashem helped us also. When somebody starts to come towards Hashem, he usually gets helps from heaven, you know, because once you start, Hashem sees that you try, and Bezad Hashem, Bezad Hashem is going to try to help you down, to help you out. Now, it says, in the fifth chapter, it says, Rabbi Yehuda ben Tema Omer, Okay, be strong, be, be, be bold, like, like a tiger, like a, a namel. Ve kalkanesha, light like a, an eagle. Ratz katsvi, fast, like a, like a deer. Ve gibor kari, and, and strong, like, like a lion. Laasot atzon avicha shabayim. Laasot atzon avicha shabashamayim. To fulfill Hashem's desire, whatever Hashem wants from you. Do you think that, what does it mean, Kal Kanesha? Light like an eagle. Is an eagle an easy bird or is a heavy bird? Heavy. It's a very heavy bird. How can you say Kal Kanesha, be, be light like, a, like, a, like an eagle? It's easy to go fast up, yeah? What do you want to say? Easy to get up. Yeah, exactly. This is what we're talking about. Because Hashem provided him with such big, enormous, huge wings, he is able to soar high so much. And, you know, he also can go down very quickly. And, and, you know, Hashem gave him the tools. And so Hashem gave us these tools too. Hashem says that this initiative is very important. So in order for a person to decide something to do, you know, be quick, be strong, be brave, whatever we said before, before too. But you know that you have the ability to do it. Just spread your wings and you will see how you're able to do uh, 
uh, to reach, to get to wherever you, wherever you want. Human being is heavy. What do I mean by heavy? The materialism pulls him down. Mm -hmm. You are sometimes, you are heavy, you don't want to move, you don't want to go, you don't want to do, sometimes you're depressed, you're heavy, you sit down, you don't want to do something, you don't want to move, yeah? So, uh, so our obligation is, okay, to soar high. You have wings, use it, go higher, do whatever you, you, you could, you could, because uh, and when you, uh, basically the wings, uh, some of the commentary says, is the happiness. When you do things in happiness, mm -hmm. uh, Bichayim Vital, which was the student of the Arekados, used to say that the fixing of the essence of the, of the sand, of Afar, which is usually the one that pulls us so much down, is to be happy. Mm -hmm. Yeah? And um, so, um, so the Yetzarara, the evil inclination, tries always to, to cause us to seem, to tell us, ah, oh, you're not able to do, you're not capable, you're nothing, what do you know? And uh, it's like gravity. The gravity pulls you down, doesn't let you to leave the earth and, and, and leap and, and, and make this uh, uh, to, to go high, yeah? And so it brings you down and down. We have to f run away from this Yetzarara uh, to get higher as much as we can from these scenes and to be and to aspire high. Va'esayat means also to rise, it nasut, to go up, to rise up. And so um, Hashem gave us very, very high levels as we left Egypt. And, and we have to use it. Listen, we, every time we pray, in, in the morning we say, What do we say each and every, I'm sorry, each and every morning? Hashem, you chose us. Mm -hmm. You gave us the power. You gave us the ability. You elevated us from all the other nations. Okay? For what? For what? The purpose is, okay, to to get closer to Hashem. So, I want to tell you a story about uh, okay uh, about in, in about eighty close to ninety years ago. Uh, a little Eliezer was born in Iran, okay, Persia, and he was a very successful boy. He was very energetic. Okay, he knew what he was doing. He learned Hebrew by himself. He started uh, being involved with um, with uh, those people who do Aliyah to Israel. He started to be until he became at the head of them. So one day he was 18 or something. He decided that he wants to go to Israel too. He came to his father and he tell his father, Abba, please let me go to Israel. I want to go. I want, I want to learn Torah there. I want to to really, you know, so the father, are you, are you crazy? What are you talking about? No one lives, uh, we're so established here. We have everything, and they were really, really wealthy family. And the boy insisted, no, I want to go, I want to go. The father takes out a paper and a, and a, and a, and a pen. He tells him, you're going to sign here now that you're going to give up all the inheritance mm -hmm. that uh, I have Okay, that I want to give you, and I guess he had many shops or stores or assets or whatever. You're going to give up on all of them if you want to go to Israel. You really want to do it? He was thinking and debating, but then he said, yes, I want to do it. Wow. So sign. He signed, and only then the father gave him a permission to go to Israel. He went by himself, alone. And you know, years ago it wasn't easy. My Husband's grandmother, she used to tell us, she also came from, from Russia to Iran. They got stuck in Iran for many, many years, and then they came to Israel. Mm -hmm. How hard, how difficult it was to get there. So many, so long it take them, took them 
to come to Israel. They had to, to bribe all kind of smugglers. And then the smugglers were not some, sometimes honest. They took their money. They never took them back to wherever they were supposed to, to go. Uh, they stayed there winter, summer, this, that, until they were able to leave Iran to come to Israel. It took him some, you know, riding on horses, on, 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 yeah. on donkeys, on camel, or this and that. So I guess he went through this uh, struggle. So it wasn't easy for him. It doesn't describe how did he, how did he come, but it wasn't easy for a young lad to do that, to sleep outside in the mountains, in the cold, in the in the heat, in this and that, whatever. Baruch Hashem, he came to Israel, and uh, over there, he was searching. So where's the yeshiva? Where can I can start learning Torah? He heard about Ponovich. Ponovich was a, the mm -hmm. biggest yeshiva in Bnei Brak. So he went to Ponovich, he went to meet Arav, uh, Arav Kahneman, who was the Rosh Yeshiva of Ponovich. So he came to him, he says, Rabbi, can I come? I would like to learn Torah over here in your Yeshiva. The Rabbi says, of course, what do you know? Do you know anything? Do you know how to learn the Gemara? He says, no. Do you know how to <coughs> read a Mishnah, a Mishnayot? He says, no. What do you know? I know Hebrew. He says, this is a yeshiva for excellent boys. Okay, we go very deep here in the learning of the Gemara. It's not even easy for simple students. You don't know the Gemara yet. It's not fit for you, this place. You know, you should go, you should really learn, maybe a private teacher or somebody that will teach you how to learn Gemara, and then no problem. Then we will test you and we will see if you fit to this yeshiva, we'll accept you. If not, you can go to a different place. At that moment, the boy, he was a tall, nice looking guy. Like, you know, kind of lowered his, his all, all his body became like really, he became pale. He was fighting so much not to, not to cry, but he couldn't really do anything. Tears started to come out of his eyes and, and he became very emotional. The rabbi saw it and he said, wait, wait, no, I will accept you, don't worry, just tell me. So right away the rabbi decided that he's going to uh, find him a chavuta that will teach him morning or, or this hour. He found so many guys that will every, each and one of them will dedicate one hour of the day to him. Within two years, he became the greatest Talmud over there. Wow. He became he was talented. He was, and if you heard this name, Harav Eliezer Ben David, about thirty years ago, he came to our community. He was in my house for about a week. He was, I guess, came to I don't know to, to maybe collect money. He was ahead of, he was ahead on the he, he had few yeshivot, also yeshivat Orochaim for girls in Israel. He was uh, the, the the rabbi there or the yeshiva there or something established the yeshiva with the rabbi Paldo. Mm -hmm. And so, I ask a question. Let's say a guy comes to the the office of the dean of the, one of the most famous universities that you know. And he will ask to be accepted to that uh, university. And uh, they will ask him a few questions and he doesn't really know his, his subject. He doesn't really know anything, okay? Will they accept him? No. no. And if he's going to start crying, will no. they accept him? No. no. You have a problem, no. yeah? How come here this boy started to tear, started to cry, the rabbi saw that he was so emotional, the rabbi understood that it wasn't easy for him to come all the way alone, you know, to, to Israel to study Torah and then he's reject, rejected that forbid and he accepted him right away. You see how some tears, how difference they make when it comes to Torah? These tears t shows us that this boy had a really a willpower, he really wanted to get somewhere, and because he was really diligent, and because he really put all his mind and heart and, and everything into it, he was able to make it and he became a big rabbi, right? So this is what we're talking about here. Alav Chaim Shmulevitz, he wrote in his book, Sichot Musa, that Shevet Levi, the tribe Levi, was never enslaved in Egypt. As hungry power was Paro, and 
and bloodthirsty he was, he was not able to enslave the Shevet Levi. Why not? As long as all the tribes were alive, also he couldn't really touch them. Why? Think about this. The tribes had their honors, had their respect, knew who they were, okay? And because they were respected, he respected them too. Once Yosef passed away, and all his brothers passed away, the Jewish people lost this uh, feeling of, uh, how do you call it? Um, Majesty, royalty. Royalty, right. Mm -hmm. Feeling greatness, they, they lost it. And so this is when he was able to catch them. This is what, but Shevet Levi never, le never allowed themselves to be like all of them. The, most, of the, uh, the, most of the nation, they were, uh, they were running after the Egyptian culture. Shevet Levi stayed in Goshen, this place, a special place for, for the Jews there. Never assimilated, never went after them, had their own yeshiva there, studied there, learned there, you know, Moshe, Aaron, all this, uh, the, the tribe of Levi. And so Paro was never able to, to touch them. Why? They felt that they're important. Once you feel that you're important, no one can touch you. Rav, once I read a story about Rav, um, what was his name? Uh, he was a rabbi, Rav, uh, I forgot his name. He was a rabbi that at the time of the Holocaust, for some reason he was in, 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 in Russia. He went to Bukhara, Samarkand, he was in these places. I forgot his name for this moment. Huh? No, no, no. And, and then he said that one night, they were in a camp, you know, in a, in a, in a, in a Holocaust. They're, they're in, a, in a war camp. He hears a voice, a noise. You know, it's pitch dark. He sees one of the people, who wasn't Jewish, takes from his, uh, his, his only bag that he had, uniform. He, was a, he had a German uniform. Puts it on, looks at himself, and feels wants to good feel feel good with himself. Puts it back, hides it back, and goes to sleep. A few times he 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 saw it, and then once he asked him, "What are you doing in the middle of the night?" He was so scared, this guy. But then he told him, "Listen. Once I was a very important uh, uh, commander. Commander. I don't want to forget that I was a very important one. Mm -hmm. I get it to my clothing, to my f uniform. I feel good about myself, and I and I." This person, says the rabbi, I knew that he has a hope. He wants to leave this place, this place one time. He wow. feels that these uh, Germans could not kill his spirit. Wow. It's very important, right? To know your position, where you're standing. Don't go, don't go low. Don't let uh, oppressor or whoever it is to, to kill your, 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 uh, your spirit. So, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, I, and it's so interesting, sometimes when you have this courage and you know who you are, you're just benefiting from this. In time of the war, World War II, in one of the sheds in the war camp, uh, so the Jewish people worked in that place, you know, and they were... Um, they were manufacturing um, all kind of uh, equipment and for and, and weapons. This is what they were doing in that uh, in that place. One day after 12 hours of shift of working, working, and the work didn't finish yet, the machine broke and stopped working. The Nazis that was on top of them was so angry. What is this? What what does it mean? And then he was looking for a victim among all these people there. And he saw this uh, person by the name um, uh, Cutler, label Cutler. And uh, he tells him, you, I want you to fix this. Till the morning you should fix it. He said, I don't know how to fix the machines. I never fixed any machines. What do you want from me? I don't care. He tells him like that. He says, you're a Jew? You know when you can. That's what he told him. <laughs> Miss King, this guy, didn't know what to do with himself. 
all that night that label okay he was uh, trying to connect to wires and and separate wires try to put things together try to uh, the, uh, assemble and uh, disassemble and this and that back and forth back and forth back and forth, until he was able to do it he fixed that machine it started working again he was shocked. The people in the camp, uh, you know, his neighbors, whoever were there, were shocked too. They were so happy. In the morning, they're waiting for the Nazi to come and see his response. So the Nazi comes and he sees that the machine is working. He was shocked himself. He said, this is impossible. He knew that he won't be able to do it. That he won't be able to do it because he really didn't know. Complicated machine. So this label saw this... Uh, uh, surprising look and this at this Nazi's face and he tells him I fixed it he says I see he says I want a reward I want to I want you to pay for it <gasps> people were shocked mm -hmm. people were afraid well, how is going to respond now what do you mean how do you dare asking you for 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 a payment now and this guy the Nazi he will shock himself too mm -hmm. and he's like what do you want, Hama, what, what do you want me to pay? What, what do you want me to give you? He tells him, give me cigarettes. He put his hand in the, in the pocket, he took out cigarettes and he gave it to him. People were shocked. Wow. They were sure that he's going to, I don't know, chop his head off or something, you know. But sometimes when you stand yeah. for, for your, your huh? for your belief, for, you, for whatever you believe, for your, uh, for your, um, uh, Take pride in your work. Yeah. So, so this is when when this Nazi didn't know what to do, and then he turned to all his friends and he told them, "You're true. You're able, and you can." This uh, is this is what he told him too. This is what taught him, gave him so much strength also for so later on. Hard. If you're Jewish, you're able. Just think always in every situation that you are. How can you get out, get get out of it? What can you do? You know. Think. So, huh? don't lose your trust. Don't lose your trust yourself. Believe in yourself. You're able to do. You're capable of doing things, right? If we have this thought all the time, it's very good. Uh, even as it says that Moshe Rabbeinu, the leader uh, that redeemed Am Israel from Egypt, was supposed to be raised up in a palace, not among his f uh, friends, his his other Jews. Why? Because he's not supposed to have. A mental a slave mentality. Uh, a slave mentality. He needs to think royal. He needs to think like a king. He, he needs to think like like someone that can come and redeem the people. Mm -hmm. If you have a, if you feel low about yourself, we know that he was humble. It's a different story. But if you feel that you're low, you're not able to do it. Mm -hmm. And uh, Moshe Rabbeinu, one of the rabbis says, you have you always you have to have two tools. One to feel like. God created the world for me. The world was created for me. And from the other side, you have to think, I'm dust, I'm, I'm, I'm sand, what am I, I'm nothing. Right? So from one side, to be humble. When to be humble? When you feel, when you feel too good about yourself, feel, you, you, need, you need this uh, humility now. But when you feel low, okay, at that moment, you have to think, uh, that uh, you know the world was created for me, and this will give you the strength and the power to leap from there and to continue to different heights. So uh, now we say in our tefillot also, Baruch Ata Hashem, blessed are you, Hashem. Asher b'char banu mikol amim, you chose us from all the nation, v'natan lanu etoloto. Right? This is what we say. As those people who were chosen, okay. We, it's like we have a crown on top of our head. Well, I'll ask you a question. A queen of England, she has a crown. Now it's not a queen, now it's a king. He has a, he has a crown on top of his head. Is it heavy or is it light? Is it limiting him or not? Does it give him pride? Or does it, you know, it's too heavy on his head? What do you think? <laughs> huh? It's heavy, it may be heavy, but it's a pleasant, uh, it's a pleasant thing, because they like it, they want it, it it's, it's honoring them, right? Yes. Now, one of the rabbis said something like that. 
uh, when when a person when he walks, but his you know his his posture is not straight. He doesn't go walk, walk straight. You know what can happen? This this uh, crown that he has on top of him can fall from him, right? If you want this crown to stay on top of your head, take it, uh, wear it proudly. You have to stand still. You have to stand high. Look upward. Animals, animals. Okay, that's the difference between animals and human beings. Animals, they walk on four. Their head is in the ground. They're always looking into the ground. What do I find? What, what do I eat? What do I this? What? I, their mind, their head, their body parts is the same. The, 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 the head does not think something special. It's the same. Human being is different. Human being, we are standing up. Our head is high. We're not looking always only down. We can look also high. This is a person. This is a human being. Aspire. Desire to aspire, if you want to call it. You want always to look up, right? And so, and so, this is what we're supposed to do. Uh, I uh, read a very. I, I, I heard a very beautiful story that Arav uh, Y.Y. Jacobson said. He said that he has a friend, he has a friend, he's a Georgian, he's Georgian. Yes. he has a friend, Chabad, he has a friend that uh, his name is Gary Targo, Targo, something like that, he lives in Michigan. One day he got a very, very angry phone call from a very, very old man that lives in Ohio. And this old man tells him, I'm so upset at you. That's not fair. What do you think about that? And he says, what happened? Well, he, he's a, a bank manager or the owner of a bank, this Gary. He says, about 40 years ago, I bought a house. Years ago, it was $40,000, okay, a house. And uh, I took a loan. He took a loan for, for the whole amount, you know, to pay the mortgage. And he keeps paying each and every month. He paid. All these years he paid. And then, nine months ago, his wife passed away. She was 91 years old when she passed away. And he was so devastated, this old man. He didn't check the mail. He didn't check, uh, you know, all the bills, whatever, whatever. And all these things piled up, piled up, piled up, piled up. He didn't pay for the mortgage for a long time. After nine months, he started to check on the mail, started to come back to himself, started to live again. And then he saw that he missed nine months of, of mortgage. Right away, he wrote a check and he sent it to the bank. The bank rejected it. Mm -hmm. They already sent it to foreclosure. They sent so many letters. He never opened these letters. It's already. It's not into in our hands. It's it's it, you know the it's in foreclosure now. So this old guy calls him. So what if I didn't uh, pay? But I paid all these years. What is this? What is this? So the man, the Gary, told him, "Don't worry. I'll I'll take care of this person. Don't worry. Don't worry." So he went up to, to the clerks, he asked them, what's the story of this and that? And they, and they say, it's not up to us anymore. We gave it up, we gave it already to a different uh, company, and they, they, they're about to sell this house already. Okay, so Gary checked how much this person still owes the bank, about $5,000, not a big deal. $5,000 is going to be finished with all the, the, the debt that he has. He took his personal check, he wrote $5,000, and he gave it to the clerk, he says, now you're going to sell it uh, overnight, you know, before they uh, sell it, uh, the foreclosure one. Now the house worth $850,000. And for $5,000, he was able to save it. Mm -hmm. He accepted it. They accepted it because, you know, he took care of this. He called the rich man, he, he, he sent him a letter, he told him it was uh, taken care of, don't worry, you don't have to pay me anything, I paid it by myself, you're fine, you can live in your house, and, 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 and everything is good. Mm -hmm. He was so impressed with this, this old guy, that this Gary came out of his way to help him. And Bob Shane, he lived three more years, he never heard of him like that. Sometime later, he got a, a phone call from a lawyer, that uh, represents this old person, he says, listen, this old person passed away. And uh, he didn't have children. His only asset was this house. Mm -hmm. 
and he wants to give it to you. Wow. Because he really was impressed from your the way that you take care of it, took care of it. He just asked if you can take care of if you if this if you can use this house for charity purposes. He asked the lawyer, do you know which charity organization? What did he care about? What did he want? He said he loved very much Israel. He says, okay, I'm going to find some organizations in Israel. I will send the whole amount. I don't need this house. I don't need, I didn't take, I won't take anything to myself. Or even sometimes you work on a case, you take some certain uh, uh, fee. fee. I won't take anything. I'll send everything to this, uh, play of this man, of this guy, no problem. For his memory. The lawyer wasn't Jewish. He hears all of this and he then tells him, you know something? I live in Ohio and I like, I, I'm, I'm a Catholic uh, man. Uh, I'm also a priest. And I like reading, you know, the Bible. I never understood why Hashem chose you to become, to, to, as a chosen nation. But now I see how you conducted all this, uh, there, now I understand. See how this a person was able to do a Kiddush Hashem without even... Is there, is there, this is what Hashem, Hashem says. Atem tiyuli mamlechet kohanim vegoi kadosh. You're going to be this uh, a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And Hashem calls them Am Segula. Ma ze Am Segula? A special treasure. He looks at, at the Jewish people as a special treasure. Okay, you got a mission. You got a mission, and 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 you try to to try to fulfill this mission as much as you can. So this is what we're talking about. I um, just wanted to tell it's another some few things here, but I don't think we have the time. Okay, so I wanted to speak a little bit about Amalek. Okay, next time as I'll share, I just wanted to finish with uh, Dina. She was uh, a teacher in a small town, in, well, again, Michigan, for some reason. <laughs> and uh, she, um, she, she, teach, she taught already many, many years. She was a very senior teacher. Few years maybe before her retirement, she was a very good uh, teacher. Uh, she also volunteered in a special project that they had there. Um, they had a special project for, a uh, national project for, um, for arts that focused on how to help kids to take responsibility on their lives. Okay? So she did all kind of, uh, all kind of tasks with the kids. One day the supervisor came into the class and he was fascinated with whatever he saw. The teacher gave all of the students, and she was she did this too. Paper, and they were all supposed to write, "I cannot, I cannot do something," right? So one student writes, um, "I cannot uh, speak fluently uh, this and this language." Let's say, one said, "I cannot um, uh, do push-ups." One says, I cannot do this. One says, I cannot do that. Uh, everyone says whatever they are not able to do. The teacher herself writes down also, I cannot convince uh, certain parents to come to PTA. I cannot um, ask my daughter uh, or something, something. And then she gathered up all the I cannot, whatever the students uh, wrote and, and, and read out loud. They all put it in a, in a box, in a shoe box, empty shoe box, and they went outside to the yard. She took a, a shovel or something, and they started to bury down this box of I cannot. Wow. Okay? Nice. And she gives a eulogy. Okay? <laughs> she, she writes a eulogy, and she writes kind of a tombstone from cardboard, whatever. She wrote, she wrote down over there that. Um, we mentioned that uh, I cannot in every place in the classrooms, in the in the gym. I cannot do this exercise. I cannot do that exercise. In the principal's office, okay. In in every place, uh, you know, in this uh, school, in the ba in the backyard or whatever. And from now on, we're going to use this 
uh, words. I can, I'm, I will do, I'm able. Okay? Instead of I cannot, I cannot. I cannot. Eventually, okay, she, she wrote this also on, uh, on, on, she attached it also onto the wall. Okay? And um, basically, every time the child would say, I couldn't do my homework because of that. Oh, I cannot do this. Oh, it's too much for me. Uh, homework, homework are too hard or something. She would tell them, I cannot die and we already buried it. Mm -hmm. Now think of what you can, right? Mm -hmm. This yeah. taught him so much. The, the supervisor, he was so impressed from this, right? Mm -hmm. So forget about whatever we can't. Now focus on what we can. I can do it. I can do it. I can do it. As Jewish people, yes, we're obligated to do so much mitzvot, but all this mitzvot elevate us, makes us greater, makes us special. You know, uh, with all this, whatever we see, what happened in, in Gaza right now also, we see a lot of things that are happening to us. Our question is um, to listen to Hashem's voice. Hashem shows us certain things. We have to learn, to, to understand what Hashem teaches us, what He wants us from whatever we saw there. And uh, come closer to Him. Uh, become a better person. Don't say I cannot work on myself. You can if you want, because Hashem puts us up. As sometimes it's all kind of circumstance that it shows that, that we can. Okay, so Bezat Hashem, let's uh, work on our qualities and become better and higher and be able to accept the Torah all from the beginning. Thank you so much. God bless you. All the best to the